Paulette Goddard. Have you ever heard of that name? But I am sure you must be aware of Charlie Chaplin. Paulette Goddard, wife of Charlie Chaplin, and one of the best actress in the history of Hollywood. As we will unfold her story, you will know why don't the industry know her name anymore. Hang on tight as we will take you through the tragic real-life story of Paulette Goddard. We all know Paulette Godot's talent in comedy and drama was the thing that set her apart when she was just 13 years old. But did you guys know that she was a child model even before she was an actress? It was these little modeling gigs that prepared her for the life of showbiz. She joined the industry at a very young age and ended up becoming one of the most famous girls that were ever known in Hollywood. She joined a company called the Ziegfeed Follies and hit it big with her role in the Crescent Moon prop thanks to the way she moved and sang. Godot was also popular for having connections with famous people like Charlie Chaplin and many others, but it was not them that made her a renowned actress. It was her acting capabilities that made her win an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress in 1943 for her mind-blowing role as an army nurse in So Proudly We Hail. But you guys won't be able to believe the things that happened in her life and the things that she managed to overcome. From being the biggest hit in Hollywood to the most unlucky actress, her tragic ending will leave you traumatized. To understand it all, make sure to watch the video till the end. She wasn't always Paulette Goddard, you know, it might sound shocking to you all, but she was born Marion Levy in 1910 in Queens, Long Island. Many people assume that just like the people of their time, she had a big family as well. But actually, she was the only child who had a very close relationship with her mother throughout her life. What happened to her father? Well, her parents got divorced when she was just a baby, and it was her mother who raised this child alone so she didn't give up on her and made sure that Levy grew up as a lovely and well-mannered child. One important fact about Goddard was her out-of-the-ordinary relationship with her mother. She wasn't like other people in Hollywood who hit it big and abandoned their families. She understood that they only had each other in the whole wide world, so however big she got in Hollywood, at the end of the day, she always managed to creep into her mother's lap at the end of the day. It was because that was the only place that had no filters and unlimited, unconditional love. Everyone nowadays thinks that the man who changed her life was Charlie Chaplin. And he was the man who also launched her career in Hollywood when he got her in the film called Modern Times. But what if we tell you that's not the case? She was very well known for her classic films like The Women, that great dictator, and reaped the wild wind. But it was a different man who gave her a push in the starting of her career. We will tell you the story about him later in this video. But one thing you all need to remember is that her acting skills were so crazy that the people not only became her fans, but they considered Goddard as their idol. Her acting career was all started when this beautiful young girl found work as a child model in a popular department store like Saks Fifth Avenue and Hattie Carnegie. You must be wondering just how a poor fatherless child got into the world of showbiz. It was her great uncle who was a successful businessman called Charles Goddard who introduced her to the world of Hollywood. While she was acting as a low-paid model and just barely making ends meet, many influential figures saw her and understood that this child was just a fresh face waiting for some big roles. It wasn't all fairy tales and rainbows for her because she wasn't that good at acting in the start. But what can you expect from an orphan who was living in the rags all her life? She had to go back and lose many opportunities that could have changed her life. But she didn't give up. She went back and got some formal acting training. It was hard work and determination that pushed her forward. And thanks to that, when came back to the industry, she became one of the most desirable actresses of the time. You people need to realize that it was a time in the 1930s and Goddard was a beautiful young lady. In the old times, Folks used to think that marriage was a must for a lady, and she met Edgar James through a suitor. He was a very rich lumber industrialist, and they quickly got married. A marriage without love does not last long, and that's what happened to them, and they got divorced just two years after being married in 1932. It wasn't all a bad thing for her because she got a big amount of money that would make sure that she could pursue her lifelong dream of becoming an actress. After her first divorce, she knew that she had to be someone who inspires others, so she gave up her given name and took on her stage name of Paulette. That name was inspired by her mother's maiden name, 
and she started her career in 1929 with a small role in Birthmarks, where she appeared alongside Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. She was still a young woman and people around her started forcing her to get married again, but she had made a final decision to permanently move to Hollywood so that the people wouldn't bother her to strengthen this resolve. She made a contract with Hal Roach Studios and ended up becoming a full-time actress. She performed in many films like The Girl Habit, The Mouthpiece, and Young Ironsides. You must have not heard of these movies before in your life, but trust us when we say that these were very small yet essential films, and they helped her to get noticed in front of the people in the industry. You must be wondering just when she will become the legendary Paulette Goddard. Well, her big break came in early 1930 when she had the chance to meet the legendary Charlie Chaplin. It happened in the shooting of the City Lights, and here Paulette was playing a small minor role. They didn't have much contact, but when they locked eyes together, they knew they were in love. Their love was so strong that Charlie bought the contract from Hal Roach Studios, and because of this, he had the power to break her shackles now, so he did, and gave her the lead female role in Modern Times, which was released in 1936. In this movie, we saw Ellen Peterson, who was a young woman that accidentally met Chaplin, who was currently very poor and trying to find a job. This movie mainly showed the horrors of industrialization, but people loved the both of them together, and her acting skills became more visible through this movie. Thanks to this, she became one of the biggest comedy hits of the silent film era, talking about them being loved on the big screen. The things happening behind the screen were not so different at all. They were both in love, and after just four years of their first meeting, they got married in 1936. It was as if Lady Luck was on her side because she starred in The Great Dictator alongside Charlie Chaplin once again, and this time, it was pretty much a gamble. It was because the political role was very questionable, as the lead female role was of a persecuted Jewish woman. This movie was based on the most sensitive topics of that time, and none of the producers wanted to fund it, so all the funds were taken out of Charlie's pocket. This movie ended up becoming one of the greatest examples of the Nazi regime, and this movie was also successful in telling people the actual cost of war. All things being said, this movie was a commercial success and earned Charlie more money than he could dream of. She was hitting home run after home run because she starred in another hit called The Ghost Breakers in 1940 with Bob Hope. This comedy horror movie showed us just how much of a versatile actress she was back then. In this movie, she was acting as a daring heroine who disguised herself as a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And needless to say, it was a fan favorite. She got another hit in the early 1940 when she appeared in The Pot of Gold, which was released in 1941, where she starred in a romantic comedy with Jimmy Stewart the same year she was also cast in the movie The Lady That Has Plans in 1942. This time, she was acting as a fashion designer who was caught in a series of lies. This movie was a big surprise for the audience because they had no idea that Goddard would be able to play a serious role in a dramatic movie so well. She then appeared in Reap the Wild Wind, which was an adventure that was set in 1840. And here we saw her falling in love with the ship captain. This was also the time's biggest hit. And through this, she became one of Hollywood's top stars. When she thought that all was going well and she was living the perfect life, she started feeling the winds of trouble. She started to notice that her loving husband was a bit more busy nowadays, and the way he looked at her was a bit different. But she was at the top of her career right now, and she couldn't afford any mistakes. It's all well and great that Goddard is known for her successful accomplishments, but did you guys know why she was so concerned about not making any mistakes? It was because back in the day, she considered the role of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. But people had some serious concerns about her common law marriage with Chaplin, and because of that, there was no legal proof of their marriage. Just this mistake of hers cost her this role in the film, and Vivian Lee got her hands on it. So she worked harder and made sure that her good name would be remembered for centuries. She appeared in a very lovely musical called A Sweater, A Song, and A Peekaboo Bang, with Dorothy L'Amour and Veronica Lake in the early 1940s, and it was the same year when she gave her greatest performance ever. She starred in So Proudly We Hail, 
where she was acting as a war nurse in the middle of the slaughters of World War II. And this movie was very terrifying for some people because the people had just gotten out of World War II, so it connected with them deeply. This movie and her acting in it were so good that this led her to the stage of Academy Awards where she won the Best Sporting Character Award. She was now at the top of the world, and people used to say that she should have stopped after winning the Academy Award. But Goddard was never a people pleaser from the start, so she worked hard even after that. Just when she thought she had gained everything, the world was shocked when she got divorced from Charlie Chaplin in 1942. This wasn't enough to stop her, so she kept working and appeared in The Crystal Ball in 1943, and then in 1945 she starred in the movie called Kitty. Now was the time for Goddard's final film of the decade called Unconquered, which was directed by Cecil B. DeMille, and this was the last big blockbuster she ever delivered. What do we mean by that? To put it simply, Unconquered was the last movie she ever did as the legendary film star of the 1940s. This was because all of her next movies started to be very underwhelming and boring. People had simply gotten enough of her by now, but she didn't give up and did some other movies like The Bride of Vengeance in 1949. Just so you people know, it was a big project by Paramount Pictures and had a huge budget but was a nasty flop. This single movie made her from one of the leading actresses in movies to a popular actress in low-budget movies. She tried again in Baghdad in 1952 and The Bolero Squad in 1953, but no one was impressed anymore. So did she ever make it big again? You will have to watch the full video to find that out. What are the things that made her such a great and sought-after actress? It was her lively personality and humor that made everyone laugh. She was not a dumb blonde at all. She was an intelligent woman who was able to talk about various topics, including things like politics, current events, and art. This curiosity and beauty were what helped her to make close friendships with people like Chaplin and many others. One of the biggest scandals that she was involved with was her relationship with George Gershwin. She was often seen to be his guest in the New York City apartment. And when she was asked, she would say that she only listened to music and engaged in conversations about art and culture with him. Nobody knew the truth, but it's a fact that she was also present at Greshwin's sudden death in 1937, and it was something very devastating for her because she had just lost a very close friend. If we are talking about her friends, then one of the other major people in her life would be Diego Rivera because she used to visit his apartment regularly. Not only that, she also appeared in one of his most popular morals called The Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Park. This connection with him allowed her into the beautiful Mexican art and deepened her understanding of art. Fast forward to the 1960s, one of her closest contacts at the time would be Andy Warhol. He was an important and famous person back then, and he used to enjoy her company. They say that she used to be a regular guest at his famous factory, and ended up appearing in some of his experimental films. You would be shocked to know that her story of married life did not end at James or Chaplin. She was married to her fellow actor, Burgess Meredith, just two years after her divorce from Chaplin in 1944. It looked as if all her luck had been used up to produce some of the greatest movies of that era, because when the couple was excited about their first ever baby, they were met with disappointment. The news of their child's miscarriage shook the couple off their feet, but they wanted to remain together and support each other in this tough time. It was as if they felt the world had ended and they couldn't bear it any longer. They divorced each other in 1949.1949 was a very tough year for her because she was very unstable. She gave love one last chance and got married to Eric Maria Remark, and this time she wanted it to last till death. So it did. They parted ways in 1970 when Remark died when they were in Switzerland. This is also the reason why Goddard is not seen or remembered today. It was because of her last husband's nature. It wasn't like he shackled her in the home or something. It was because she and her husband both wanted a peaceful and quiet life away from the spotlight. She was an actress, but she still respected her husband's wishes. So in the latter years of their union, they used to walk around Switzerland away from the claws of Hollywood. Did you guys know about the mountains of wealth Goddard had? It was all because of her first husband, who was the wealthy businessman that we told you about. 
Other than that, she also made a great amount of money from her acting career, so she was able to live her life in luxury. She was known for her generosity and the way she used to help others was simply outstanding. She had tons of money and she wanted to make sure that the money was used for something good, so she helped others with her money. Do you guys remember how we told you that she was an art enthusiast? Well, she had to sell her huge art collection and she sold it after raising it to $2.9 million. She gained so much in her early life that life had everything to take from her. So in the latter years of her life, back in the 1970s, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. But she did not let go and fought it off on the same footing and she completed the treatment and ended up coming out as the victor. One of the biggest reasons that Goddard is remembered is because at the end of 1970, she donated $20 million to New York University. She wanted to make sure that the money she possessed was used to help others in pursuing education. The 20 million that she left was used to help countess of the faculty members, students, and people who needed them, and all of them remember Goddard in their heart and wish her the best for the generations to come. She had such an amazing life and such a tragic end. She passed away on April of 23, 1990 in Switzerland after suffering from heart failure. She passed away at the age of 79, and it is known that the last place of her slumber is in the Ronco Cemetery, where she is lying next to her last husband.